Hey, this is Oscar Beckler, and I'm here to talk about site size drawing and painting. Today I'm going to try doing some watercolor site size uh, master copying. This is by uh, uh, Jose Tapira, I think I'm saying that right, uh, Ibarra. And he was a really cool painter. And so I decided to sit down and try painting him. So uh, you can see that I'm starting off with uh, something of just a baseline where I have the picture on my laptop over here and my drawing set up over here. You can like actually put a sheet of watercolor over your, uh, over your screen and trace it. But right now I'm trying to do site size lines. So you can see how I'm setting this ruler up. And I'm just going to make a little mark here at some point along these major landmarks of the top of the head, the eyebrow, the eye line, the nose, the mouth. And these are going to be just some baseline uh, landmarks. And I'm going to use these throughout the drawing to compare and contrast. So, uh, for instance, when I hold the ruler up under the nose, I can see across on a horizontal line where the ear comes in. Like, is the bottom of the ear slightly bigger or smaller? Uh, and this sort of just gives me a scaffolding. I'm trying not to over draw this right now because I want to do it the majority of my drawing with watercolor and a lot of times if you over render in the drawing phase and then you start watering it first off you erase a lot of that work that you did in the drawing and second off um, you know it just ends up being a repeat of the process so for instance right now I'm checking out where my ear lines up and how does that intersect with the neck so for instance the neck you can have a line that goes straight up and it intersects on the y-axis with one of those cockle shells. And I'm doing this in pencil. It might be hard to see, but I'm just roughing it in. And I don't want to go too far because I want to dive into paint as soon as possible. But just enough to get it in there. If you don't have a ruler, usually I don't have a ruler. And I prefer to do this with, um, uh, I prefer to just use my pencil. So having done that, I have uh, wet the whole paper. And this paper actually is something that, before working on it, I soaked the entire page in water. I like submerged it entirely. And you can think of it almost like a dried up plant is how this watercolor paper works. It's full of all these little capillaries. And the capillaries are so dry that they don't have any capillary response where they'll pick up any water. So as a result, you have to get it really wet, and then it'll have enough capillary response that pigment can flow into it. That's also going to make it so that it doesn't immediately dry when it goes on. And that's where you get a lot of the flexibility in watercolor. Watercolor is notoriously inflexible, uh, but in the early stages, if it's really wet, you can make sure that you have that capillary response. So I'm starting by getting the page wet again, and I'm going to start with a wash. A wash, you can see it here, is a watercolor technique in which you put a wet brush into pigment and you put that wet brush on a wet canvas and it really blends, it spreads, and uh, it's almost like you're drawing with puddles. And that's what you want. Because it's so wet, you won't have a lot of hard edges where it dries at first because it's just going to keep soaking through. And this is a uh, time in the painting where you have a lot of flexibility. If I run a... Uh, paper towel over this it'll soak the paint right off and I'm trying to work really broad I don't want fine details yet you want to work general to specific so you can see like I make uh, you know I even block in the whole background knowing that I can then erase with just dabbing and I'm trying to dab rather than um, uh, run strokes along this so after that I think my palette uh, has just a couple of wet watercolor of uh, watercolor tube paints poured onto it, but I'm also using dry watercolors. You can see on the side there, and I'm using a little bit of burnt sienna and yellow for the lay-in, and I'm actually making a mixture of blue. I think it's uh, Prussian blue, blue or ultramarine blue, plus that uh, burnt sienna, and it's going to have pigments that suck up the blue light, pigments that suck up the red light. As a result. Very little light is left, and you actually have something approaching black. It's not pure black. It's not perfect. Um, black pigment is valuable in its own right, but it does the job for just getting a value statement. 
And that's what I think is interesting with watercolor is a lot of times you can focus on value rather than color. So um, at some point, you can always keep subtracting with watercolor, but you can't pull back. And so you almost want to think of watercolor painting like painting with sunglass lenses. Each lens of a sunglass, if you had like transparencies that were like rose colored, each one is going to make it darker and darker and darker until you can't really see through it. Um, so you have to make sure that you take your time with it. And working with these big broad strokes kind of gets me there. Uh, as I work, I'm using a dry brush here. So a lot of times I'm uh, either putting paint down a little thicker or I'm using a brush that's maybe moist but not too moist. A lot of times I'm checking my load on the brush right beforehand. And I'll actually soak water up. So I'll dab on this to soak water out of it. And that makes it so that I can use the brush to sort of clean pigment off and also dry the uh, this. Um, so you can use this as, uh, I believe it's a mop brush. And all the time I have a brush that doesn't serve as a painting tool. It serves as an eraser where I'm using it to um, smudge things out of the way or suck stuff off of the canvas. So this approximation of value is so uh, close that um, I can move it uh, a little bit at a time. There you can see I just put down uh, some green. Actually, we can go back and watch it. So this is an example of how you can get some color into this. I'm putting some green in here, not because this area is green, but there are green notes in it. And I don't have to keep them there exactly. Um, and then I'll use that mop brush to soak up some of the green paint. But especially in like the transition from shadows to light, there's ten, there tends to be more chroma. So you'll notice like uh, this man has a lot of blue tones in the highlights uh, where the shadows turn into things. And so just always think about those transitions. And always know that you can keep building values. You can always go darker. But you can't necessarily go lighter. Uh, I'm using a brush that so I'm starting to, to use a, a, uh, a lot of a times fine point you brush you hold that and I'm holding it directly down. down and this is going to make it and so that uh, what that'll do is if you have water and pigment the pigment will sink to the bottom and the water will go up and so it creates this capillary um, layering where there's more pigment on the bottom of the brush and less on top which means that you can do a lot of things so like if you're careful with it you can use it for fine points. And you'll notice here that uh, the paper is finally starting to be dry enough that uh, when I put the watercolor down, it has a hard edge. Now this is something that's a look of watercolor. You can see my cat there too. Um, but it's also something that can uh, be really frustrating because if you're trying to have blended edges, it can cause problems. But what I do here is I use a secondary brush to blur the edge. So uh, that's usually my strategy, and you, it, it's a timed event. So you put it down, and you have a limited amount of time where you can blur it. But you can put a stroke down that's thicker than you want. It's hard on one edge, and it's hard on both sides. And then where you want the soft edge, you blend it with the secondary one. Yes? What? Are you nervous? No. <laughs> what do you want? What? So while my cat runs around underneath here, you can see that I'm starting to realize where I need darker values. And at this point, I have enough of the drawing in that I feel comfortable with this. And so I look at, I pick an area, I ask myself, is it too dark or too light? And if it's too light, I add more pigment. And if it's too dark, I try to mop it away. Again, like it's, it's tough with the watercolor, but like you do have a sort of eraser-like quality that you can use. I'm using that fine tip, and a lot of this is something where you have to like have it in such a way so that you're drawing almost with your pinky such that you'll always have the brush the same distance from the paper, and that way you can make sure that just like the final two hairs on the tip are touching it. So there you can see I used a mop to pull this off. As I work, I'm starting to get to the point where I can focus on details more, and I'm starting to look at the texture. Now, the watercolor texture is something where 
the paper is now dry enough that I can use the bumps and scratches of the paper to get this. A lot of times how this works is if this is the paper, I use the brush flat to it and I'm trying to draw with like the curved bump of where the bristles are. So I'm not using the tip, I'm using the side of them. And that's going to make it fall off in such a way that it's like uh, a little more textured and it has like almost like a chalk-like look to it. A lot of this is about testing your brush load before every, uh, every paint stroke. If I have too much water, a lot of times it won't work. If I don't have enough water, a lot of times the thing I'm trying to get won't work. But really that's what you're trying to train yourself for is just, it's, it's pretty simple when you boil it down. Hard edges versus soft edge, uh, textured edge versus clean edge, and uh, then fine details. So now I'm starting to move in with this fine detail brush and uh, some of this isn't going to work as well. Like you can see on his beard, I tried to blend it. But uh, what ended up happening is um, I was point, uh, painting with the point and therefore it didn't have that texture to it. So that's something where uh, if I could redo this, I'd probably use like a fan brush. Fan brushes are really great in that they're almost always textured as long as they're pretty dry. Now I can always go darker. I can't necessarily always go lighter. So... Uh, you can see where I'm starting to build that statement up. And you also want to paint generic to specific. So I was focusing on the specific for long periods of time, and now I'm pulling back. I'm trying to also add in some, uh, some more vibrating colors. Again, you can make black out of a mixture of reds and blues and purples and pinks and greens. And... If you do it, in if you know that and understand that chemical composition of how they're going to mix, you can use it to your advantage so that you have like a green and a blue and a red kind of touching. And wherever they're touching together, it'll blend and turn black. But in the edges where they're not blending, you'll get a lot more vibrancy. So that's why I'm like putting, I'm building his forehead out of blue. Uh, eventually, that's going to be something that just mixes with a little bit of uh, red to get the right value. Again, value is just lightness and darkness. But it'll mix down in such a way that's a little more appealing. So there up, I'm going to rewind and show this one more time. So up here on the top, I'm starting to uh, get into the details. And this is where I use that blended edge technique again. You'll, you'll see that I'm painting in the details of this shell on top of his head a little harder than I need to. Then I go in with a brush that actually has no pigment, it just has water, and I sort of damage the edge where I need to have less hard edges. And then I can also use a paper towel or a mop brush to suck that up. A lot of these things are shape-based, so a lot of times I just pick an area and Try not to think about it as uh, a human face. Try to break down the shadow shape into something. So like behind his ear, that hair shape kind of looks just like a simple pyramid, right? That's all you need to think of it as. And now that I look at it, uh, I can see that I was a little bit off. I think I went, I drifted his neck a little too far back. Now you can't necessarily paint white with watercolor, but once you're all done, you can always go in with, uh, white out and add a little bit of final details. So that's something that uh, is also fun about watercolor is although it hits a certain point where you don't want to mess with the colors anymore, you can always go back and maybe bring the values up. So I'm just using a Presto white out pen and carving in some of the background, making some of these edges a little more true to this. And there you go. Anyways, hope you enjoyed.